Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? Welcome to the seventh session of the intellectual seal of the critical seal. Call it what you like, but what we're going to call it here is the multidisciplinary approach to the seal studies. That's what we're trying to do here. Uh, actually, uh, we've been doing a lot of that, which is we've been looking at psychological studies, we look at historical aspects, we look at philosophical aspects, and we've been trying to synthesize, amalgamate, and merge all of those things into creating a product which is new, novel, and original for the people to consume. Today, inshallah, we're going to be covering one of the final chapters, the penultimate rounds of the Meccan period. In fact, this is hopefully going to be the second last thing of the Meccan period. And then after that, we're going to do next session, the final thing in the Meccan period, and we move on to the Medinan period. And today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about some key moments in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa For example, we're going to be speaking about the conversion of Umar ibn Khattab to Islam. We're going to be speaking about uh, the migration of the Muslim people to Abyssinia. And in fact, there were two migrations. So we're going to be explicating some of those and some other issues which are extremely important for our purposes. One of them, and the last thing we're going to be covering today, is the boycott. We talk about boycotts now with Gaza and all these kind of things. Yes, we're going to be speaking about when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba and the companions were in fact boycotted themselves. And so all of those things are extremely important and can be practically uh, looked at in light of some of the things that we're going through today, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Gaza crisis, which is now uh, uh, definitely going to reach the history books. So it's an uh, important thing to comment on as well. So the first thing I want to remind you of is the Prophet Sallallahu's uh, lineage, and we're doing this every week. Uh, just if you want to take a look at it in the slides, this is these are the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because you don't need to know the whole name, but if you know some of those names, it would be good. If you want to pause the video and do that in your own time, then go ahead and do that. And we're going to jump straight into it by saying that actually there's, with the conversion of Amr al Khattab, there's a lot of stories, unfortunately, when I done my research, I found are not authentic. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Uh, it didn't mean that um, that story did not take place, but it just means that the, the, the hadith does not reach the level of authenticity. Which ones are we talking about in particular? There is a hadith which said that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Umar ibn Khattab was going to the Prophet and then he saw his sister, you know, reading Surah Taha and so on in the Mus'haf and her husband and then he batted them and beat them and all these kind of things and then after he felt sorry for her and then afterwards he went to the Prophet and then he became Muslim. This story is, is, not, is not authentic, effectively. Most scholars of hadith don't accept that this story is authentic. However, it doesn't mean to say there was nothing narrated authentically about the conversion of Amr. So what I found, and in the beginning we spoke about this, what kind of sources are, are we going to cover in terms of the authentic Prophet's seerah? Um, and this is Ibrahim al-Ali's kitab. Uh, Ibrahim al-Ali wrote a book about the, uh, the Sahih seerah. That's very useful, to be honest, because what he does is he puts footnotes at each of the hadiths and you can see uh, what the authenticity of it is. And so on this section where he's talking about the um, conversion of Amr ibn Khattab, there is the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is, is, is authentic, which is that Allah ma'ayz al-Islam bi ahabba hadayni rajulayni ilayk. So he said, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a hadith that, oh Allah, you know, Aiz uh, al-Islam give might and honor and dignity to Islam with one of these two men or with the one of them who is most uh, beloved to you and he's talking about the two Umars either Abu Jahl or Umar ibn Khattab because Abu Jahl's real name is actually Umar as well so this is the first thing and I want to pause here and, and think about this with you guys because it's a very interesting principle right uh, the principle at play is that actually the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi understood the fact that there's human beings are social creatures when you have charismatic individuals that become Muslim, influential and charismatic individuals that become Muslim, that this has an impact on the entire society. So he actually made dua from that perspective because he realized that having a strong influential leader at a time where there were uh, minorities would actually increase and better and strengthen the case of Islam sociologically. And the opposite is also true, by the way. Like, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَقَاتِلُوا أَئِمَّةَ الْكُفْرِ إِنَّهُمْ لَا أَيْمَانَ لَهُمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَنْتَهُونَ That and fight, fight the leaders of Al-Kufr, of disbelief. Robert Greene in his book, uh, 48 Laws of Power, one of the laws that he puts is that strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. 
you, 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 you strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Now, as uh, Tarek and I have discussed, and I agree with Tarek, uh, he's, mashallah, writing a book, almost in refutation, and I agree with this uh, approach to this Machiavellian, this uh, crass Machiavellian approach of the 48 laws of power, uh, because it's bereft of the, the honor and the spirit that we really believe in. And actually, I would add to that a criticism of the 48 laws of power, and this is a tangent point, but, and all of Robert Greene's books, is that really Machiavellianism, as it were, or consequentialism, and these kind of things are only really applicable or even functional when people have big guns or big money. If you try and implement a lot of these 48 laws of power with your wife, and there's a lot of people using the Red Pill Youth Movement, using it with their wife and using it with their friends, and trying to leverage their own friends and these kinds of stupid things, it doesn't work because you don't have big guns and you don't have big consequences. In fact, The Prince that was written by Machiavelli, okay, the, it's a small book called The Prince, it was actually meant for princes. It wasn't meant for the lay people. And that was for a reason, because the lay people cannot implement these kind of things and try and twist your arms, a friend's arm and do this and, that, and the other. But the point I'm making is that there are some of these laws which are continually true, which is, that, for example, uh, this consequential law that if you try and take out the leaders of a certain place, you strike the shepherds and the sheep will scatter. And that is in the Quran. That the the big leaders of the kufr identify them, number one. We have these conversations off camera. We always ask, who are the ones we have to go after next? We spoke to this one, we spoke to that one, we went to this one, we went to that show. And congratulations on Musa for the show, mashallah, that you went to and to the talk TV and you made a mincemeat of these two individuals that, <laughs> <laughs> you know... Uh, that were humiliating themselves. However, this is a principle at play. You've got to think about, it's better to take out a guy that people think, or a people that people think are top guys, than, than uh, the lay person. So yes, the Prophet made dua for that, and his dua was accepted. Now, it could have been that the dua wasn't accepted, because in لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبَتَ وَلَكَنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ It could be that Allah didn't accept, because the issue of guidance... You know, it's not always the case that the Prophet has to get what he wants in terms of who gets guided. And we spoke about that, but the case of Abu Talib last time. However, this time, it was accepted, and it was accepted in the case of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And really, there's the closest thing to a strong hadith that I've come across is... Um, actually, first of all, before that, there was a very interesting... The Prophet's hadith that I've also come across, which uh, Ibrahim al-Ali mentions in his book, yes, that the Prophet said... Uh, may Allah take out what's in his heart. So he struck Amr al-Khattab. Take out what's in his heart of ghil, of, 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 of resentment. You know? And uh, basically he said that three times and uh, he, he struck him. So this is a hadith which Ibn Ali mentions and he, he, he reckons this is a hadith. Another hadith which is interesting is, and this is the closest thing to a conversion story which is authentic, which I've come across. And this is in a Tabarani's uh, book. A lot of scholars have accepted this authenticity, obviously, as I mentioned. Ibrahim Ali mentions it in his book, and he reckons it's a Sahih Hadith. Which is, um, the Prophet ﷺ was reciting uh, one day in the Kaaba, Surah Al-Haqqa, the 70th Surah of the Quran. Umar ibn al-Khattab started listening, and he became entranced by this, and he was very... Uh, found it wondrous. After that, he went after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and um, he, but because in his mind, a lot of the objections that he had uh, were being answered by the ayat of the Quran. Innahu la khawlun rasulun kareem that is certainly the, the words of a noble messenger. It's not the, the words, because he thought in his mind, okay, maybe it's a poet that put this together. So straight away, subhanAllah, the ayah is not the, it's not the speech of a poet. So each of the objections of Umar ibn al-Khattab were being re responded to like that. So this is the strongest hadith that we have to, about Umar's conversion. A lot of hadiths actually about Umar al-Khattab are false, especially about before he became Muslim. One of them is actually the hadith uh, that the Shia use, a lot of them use it to show that the, they try and deprecate and diminish and abase the character of Amr al-Khattab by saying that, um, for example, you know, when he had a daughter, 
that his daughter, you know, he buried his daughter in the Quran. Allah, he reprimands those people who used to kill their infanticide, he used to kill their own daughters. And so one of the hadiths I mentioned is uh, that he, the hadith is daif, weak, that he killed his own daughter and that right before she died, she was gra grabbing onto his beard and these kind of things. And we're going to speak about Amr al-Khattab after the series, maybe some other time, where we'll go into more detail about his character because he's a phenomenal character. This man was a mountain, uh, you know, both physically and intellectually. And I'm not talking about uh, Ali, uh, Ali Dawa, who just came into the, <laughs> the room. No, we're talking about Amr al-Khattab. He was, a, he was a, a man that made a mark in this community, certainly one of the most influential. So yes, he became a Muslim. And then um, some, some of the Sahaba, and this came very interesting, that they stated that Allah, he dignified and gave honor to the Muslim people when Umar ibn Khattab became a Muslim. Now, this is a very significant thing to be said. It shows you the importance and the power of personalities. Now, we say, look, even uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, you know, whoever can, man or something like this, which is that whoever wants to follow someone, follow the one who died because the living one, you don't know the fitna might afflict them. So on one perspective, yeah, we shouldn't be attached to figures so much because if we are attached to figures, then it can destroy our iman and so on. But from another perspective, the Sahaba acknowledged that when Umar became a Muslim, that it gave additional izzah and dignity and honor to the Muslim people. So we do need figures to come out and take that role to a lesser extent, of course, that Umar al-Khattab and the companions took, which is to give izzah to the Muslim people. This very important thing that Muslim people can do is aim and aspire to be in their community as Umar was in his which is to give dignity and honor to the Muslim people. So Amr al-Khattab became a Muslim. Now, at the same time, in the Meccan period, the Prophet Muhammad suffered a lot of psychological abuse. You know, they would give him, they would give him a hard time. They would say bad words about him. They would abuse him. And Allah revealed so many ayahs. One of them is, in fainaka al mustahzi'in That certainly we have sufficed you with those who mock. And this is, wallahi, very applicable to our times nowadays, even in the social media era. Because we're getting attacked. The Muslim community as a whole is getting attacked in the West and elsewhere. And this whole Palestine conflict has highlighted that at a tremendous level, an accentuated level. And the question is, how did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is the Islamic way of dealing with that? Of being abused of the, like that? You'll find, and we saw this in the previous session when we were speaking about it, the Prophet sometimes was very fiery in his response. When we were talking about, which, who remembers? What was the statement that the Prophet said? Yes. It, uh, it was a warning that he said he will kill you. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, I came to with slaughter. slaughter yeah. Yeah, but these were guys that were trying to attack the Prophet. Well, how did he respond? He, wasn't, he didn't have an uh, army at this time. Uh, we spoke about what Ibn Hajar was, uh, said about that. He was speaking specifically to these people who were abusing him, not to all the people. Yes? I came to you with slaughter. He didn't come and say, well, get, slap me in the left thing, I'll give you the right. He didn't do that. Even in the Meccan period, it was the same period where there was weakness happening and they were trying to abuse the Prophet. He said, لَقَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِذَّبْحَ It happened. Sometimes he would ignore it. Sometimes he'd be strategic. he would employ whatever strategy worked at the time. But this pacifist persona that they've tried to create the Prophet especially in the Meccan period, is a false one. It's a false one. And in fact, the Quran mentions what Nuh السلام, done when the people were mocking him. Who, who knows what I'm talking about? Don't leave any of them behind. No. That, that, that's something else, but before that, they were literally mocking him, and it says, "In tasharu minna, fa inna nasharu minkum kama tasharun." This is a very interesting principle. Noah was getting Noah, Noah, and this is for a long time, we believe, hundreds of years. He was being abused psychologically, and not just him, his community, which is a minority community, Muslims, because it's minna, it's not minni. He says, "In tasharu minna." If you're going to mock us. For in that, so we're going to mock you like you mock us. 
This is in the Quran. Some people say, why are you mocking that guy? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I'm saying, Noah, are you better than him? When the Prophet said, لَقَدْ جِبْتُكُمْ بِالذَّبْحَ Are you better than the Prophet Sallallahu When the Prophet Sallallahu responded, and when we go to the Medinan period, it will get even more uh, serious, frankly. So what? That didn't happen. So they try and create a pacifist religion. Because, temperamentally, they've been uh, smashed. And they try and do isti'ana with the Meccan period. But look how they sabr in the Meccan period and this and that. The Meccan period, I can show you the fair share of ayat and hadith and so on where the Prophet was very fiery back to these people. <coughs> Made dua against them. Yes, Ali. So in Surah Mutafafin, yes. you know, Allah SWT says, So today those who believe will laugh at the disbelievers. Yes. Like, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, people think this is like weird, but it does because it says they used to do the same. So they'll be on so reclining. That's more eschatological. Yeah, but no. still, the point is what? That um, yes. we will see have they been paid back for what they've done. Inshallah. And that's uh, the case. So here the, the lesson to be learned is Allah was consoling the Prophet. And this is a beautiful thing about the Quran. How we see that Allah is consoling the Prophet. Which shows you something important about the Prophet Sallallahu character. That he did not suffer from psychopathy. I know this sounds like a very <coughs> trivial point to some people. But he wasn't a psychopath. Because, let me explain, I know this sounds... Have you ever seen interviews with psychopaths? I mean, funny enough, Piers Morgan. Yes. <laughs> of all people, done a whole series with them. Yes. Maybe he took so many of their attributes um, because, because of his insensitivity. As, 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 as Musa kept saying in the interview, stop being insensitive, you know. <laughs> so he said that so many times in the interview. The next morning, I was, my wife said something. I said, stop being... You, you don't be so insensitive. <laughs> But uh, what I was saying was that uh, if you watch, and this, this is a very interesting thing, bro. Go home and watch an interview with a psychopath. Do you know when people say, I don't care what people think? I never believe it. <clears throat> Unless you're a psychopath, you will always care what other people think. You're a social creature. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cared what people think. النَّاسُ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقَّ أَن تخشى. This is in Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah says about the Prophet, and this is about Zainab's marriage to him, yeah, and we'll talk about that in the future, that you fear the people. Allah is reprimanding the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He says, and you fear the people, and Allah is more be, 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 deserving that you fear him. There is, I think, one incident. The Prophet Sallallahu was walking away with, walking with his wife. It was a dark time. Yes. So he stopped to a guy and he said, this is my wife. Yeah. This one's a little bit different because I'm, what I'm talking about here is, you're right, he, because he said that the shaitan runs in your yeah. thing. But I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that w the question is, when they attack the Prophet, and we're going to speak about this in the next session a little bit more with Ta'if and so on, but when they at hurled psychological abuse, was he affected by it? Yes, he was affected by it. If someone says, no, he wasn't affected by it, then this is actually uh, not a proper representation of the psychology of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was hurt by it. Few guys. He was hurt by it, and that's normal and natural. And it's part of the fitna of the, what Allah has prescribed for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was hurt. And that's why Allah revealed those ayahs. Inna kafaynaka al-mustahzi'een wa la yahzunka al-lazina yusari'awna fil kuf. Do not let these people who are chasing a disbelief um, yahzunka. Uh, uh, make you uh, f grieve you, O Muhammad yeah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, uh, yeah, but that's a little bit different, but still, still the case mm -hmm. that he was very concerned. That you're gonna, are you gonna kill yourself? That they do not believe in this, uh, this, this speech. Another verse. That they won't believe. Same thing. But we, so the Prophet was, con he was definitely concerned. And, he, and when people held abuse at him, it's incorrect to say that he was like a robot. He did nothing, he didn't touch him. Everything was water off the duck's, the duck's back. No, it wasn't. It did hurt him. And he complained of it. Yes. What about the thing, you know, when Wahshi killed Hamza? Like, it was to the exactly. level, Beautiful. It to the level where he was like... Yeah, I can't, I can't see you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So but what I'm saying is this, is that now in the age of social media, People will say, oh, I don't care what people think. Everyone cares what everyone else thinks. But it depends on how significant the other person is. How many views it gets. It's only normal and natural. Oh, you shouldn't care what they think. Don't say that to people. Of, co uh, of course they're going to care what people think. That is a shallow understanding of human psychology. They, are, they are, Of course human ca people care about what other human people think. 
The Prophet ﷺ, if he can, then we will all care. Unless we're psychopaths, and it's not good. And we were talking about um, Robert Greene, <laughs> and he actually wrote a book called Human Nature. And I read that book cover to cover. <laughs> no, honestly, he has some interesting insights, but he said something interesting. He said someone who's not empathetic, and to be a psychopath is not to be empathetic, by the way. If you have psychopathy, you cannot be empathetic. Because to be empathetic, or sympathetic, sim em empathetic is to put yourself in other people's shoes, sympathetic is to feel pity for other people, right? But to be empathetic, you can't be a psychopath. A psychopath is bereft of uh, em empathetic skills. He makes an interesting point, which is that it's unstrategic. So if you don't have the ability to empathize, if, if Allah created in the Prophet Muhammad Sallam that he doesn't care what everyone thinks in that way, then it would be unstrategic. Why? And it's a very interesting thing that he mentions. He mentions that because you can never predict what the other person is going to do. Because you don't, you can't put yourself in their shoes. So you can't predict what they're going to do. Does that make sense? You can never predict the next action of person B. It's a very interesting point. You cannot be a good strategist if you, if you don't have empathetic skills. Because you don't know if I, if I do this to A, well, how is he going to react? And it will destroy your personal life. So the fact that Allah has put that in the, the empathetic skills and the sympathetic skills in the process and, and not made him into some kind of a psychopath is an important thing for us to realize. The Prophet ﷺ, yes, he was, in fact, uh, abused, or that there were words of abuse hurled at him. So many. The woman came to him and said, Mudhamman. And the, subhanAllah, it's amazing how the Prophet ﷺ reacted. We said that the Prophet ﷺ didn't exhibit traits of psychopathy, but he also didn't exhibit traits of what they call nowadays as narcissism. Let me explain. Do you know, a lot of the times when people attack the Prophet ﷺ and Islam in general, they talk about the blasphemy laws. And if you look at some of the developed arguments of these people, some of them will say, look, the Prophet ﷺ couldn't tolerate criticism, therefore he had to kill everybody. Yeah, that's uh, effectively uh, in a very crass way. But look, at, I'm going to give you two examples. And a lot of the Ahnaf actually use these examples to show that there is no blasphemy if someone who is, um, for example, a, a, a Christian or a Jew mentions blasphemy words that they're not to be killed or anything happens. That's, a, that's an opinion in Islam. I can show you the, I can show you the uh, evidences for that. But the point is this, is that there's, two, there's very, two very interesting things. Number one, where the person came to the Prophet and called him Mudhammam. Now, as, as you know, Muhammad means the praised one. Mudhammam means the dispraised one. So she tried to insult him. Now, how did he react to that? Did he start swearing and shouting and said, who are you talking to like that? Do you know, do you know who I am? And start smacking and, and punching. No, he didn't do any of that. He said, uh, no, no. He, he completely ignored her, effectively. The other uh, situation is, and this happens in the Medina period, but I'll still mention it here, is when the group of Jewish people at the time came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and started abusing him. Instead of saying, Assalamu Alaikum, he said, Assalamu Alaikum. That may the death be upon you. Salam means peace. Death, Sam is peace. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she started abusing them. Like she started, you know, swearing at them and stuff. Yeah, and he, cursing them, effectively. Because the wife of the Prophet, she couldn't tolerate someone speaking like that about her husband, which shows you a good wife is someone who, you know, who has that kind of quality. Some, some wives would like it. They say, continue, my friend, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then what did the Prophet say? He said, مَا كَانَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ وَمَا نُزِعَ الرِّفْقُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَهُ It's a hadith in Bukhari. He said that, don't, speak, don't say that. He said, just, if they give you, be proportionate. If they swear at you and they say, Assalamu alaikum, you say, wa alaikum. Just say, and you too. Be proportionate. That is a proportionate response. <laughs> but to say all of these curse words and stuff, you're, now you're showing too much emotion here. So he's showing us how to deal with insult. And then he said something beautiful. He said that, الرفق, which effectively means gentleness. He said gentleness was not in anything except that it beautified it. And it wasn't removed from anything except that it made it ugly. So he's saying that there's a, there's a classy way of responding to insults and sometimes I, I, this is going to sound very controversial but we have to throw in a bit of controversy sometimes otherwise it will get dull sometimes 
Elegance is in the profanity. Sometimes you've got to get dirty. Sometimes it's clean to get dirty. Sometimes you've got to be a bit mocking and this and that and go deep, go below the belt. And I will mention some hadith, but maybe some other times where the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr and others went, went for it. But I'm not going to do it now because it's going to describe the course of discussion. But what I'm saying to you is sometimes elegance can be in the in, in, in being a little bit, sorry to say, I'm not going to say in, in the profanity because that would be a bit crass, but in the lack of elegance in a way from one perspective but if you if you be profane in from one perspective yani for example if someone came and said something to your wife or something to your mother it's not the same as if someone came and said something to you you use words like if you said the same thing in this context in the context number two then i would question your manhood Do you know what i mean so sometimes you have to be a bit profane but you you decide when to do that but not in a bad way, by saying anything. Swear words, this is not allowed in Islam. But you can insult and humili humiliate somebody and mock them in a very classy manner. Oscar Wilde used to do that. How did he... Tell me. Uh, he <laughs> tell me, <laughs> I need to get some tips. No, well, Oscar Wilde, he's famous for his um, comebacks. Yeah. You know, he, he was a playwright and uh, uh, back in the 19th century. And he's got a litany of comebacks, which That's are... Beautiful. I want some of those comebacks, yeah. I'm sure. In Arabic poetry, there's a whole genre called al hijab which is effectively just insults. You should see what they say to each other, but it's very... And there were top guys in there. In those... Who's al Akhtal and who's the other one? Hutayya. Who? Hutayya. Yeah, Hutayya. And there's another one. Who, who are the two guys? Hutayya is the well-known. Sheikh you know, can you give us something? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> can you tell, tell me of this? Huh? An example. Uh, what's a good example about the kilab? I think you said it before. I, I was asking you about this. <laughs> uh, there's a poet. Uh, yes. He mentioned the following. I, I'll translate it. He قول يا عمرو. He's talking to a guy called Amr. في وجهك طوله. You have a long face. وفي وجوه الكلاب طوله. And dogs have long faces. Then, مقابح الكلب فيك طرا. The bad things within a dog. Are يعني, apparent within you. <laughs> تزولوا عنها ولا تزولوا. That the, that those bad things about the dog, at least the dog has the potential, the possibility that it would be deprived from them. But it will never, you, you will never be deprived of those bad things. وفيه أشياء صالحات, meaning that the dog has a couple of good traits. حماك الله والرسول that Allah عز وجل uh, protected you from those good traits. فالكلب <laughs> وافن <laughs> that uh, the dog is ايش وافن وفاء. Uh, yeah, yeah. فالكلب yeah. وافن uh, a dog is a, a, a loyal. وفيك غدر and on, but you on the other hand traitor. are a traitor. Yeah. ففيك عن قدر سفور that you are way beneath the, the status of a dog. <laughs> and, and when we look at your family, <laughs> yeah, your, your family is the worst. <laughs> Sounds like me with Shmoni, is it? The bad situation about your family is a long and lengthy story. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that if you look at their faces, they are so ugly to the end that uh, that uh, a, a person remembers يعني, the day of judgment after that. Uh, uh, but when you look at the back of their necks, uh, uh, they are used as drums, meaning that uh, they are insulted. <laughs> then he mentioned Mustafilan, Mustafilan Fa'ilan Fa'ulu, Mustafilan Fa'ilan Fa'ulu. It doesn't contain any meaning in itself. It's just what we call Awzan. Mm. It's uh, a, a way to know the poem. So Mustafilan Fa'ilan Fa'ulu, Mustafilan Fa'ilan Fa'ulu, Baytun, it's a verse within this poet. It delivers the meaning of your life, meaning that you don't have but any meaning, going meaning on. of existence. <laughs> so that's just an example. That's, that's amazing. I need to memorize that one. Things things mean, but mockery is also mentioned in the Quran by Allah. Like, for example, uh, 
كمثل الكلب إن تحمل عليه يلهث وإن تتركه يلهث Very uh, powerful verse It's talking about some the munafiq actually Well like, if you read these verses before I, I cannot remember the verses that come right before but very powerful uh, uh, There's a historical example as well uh, mm. from Harun al-Rashid mm. when a Roman emperor or th- I mm. think a uh, subordinate of the Romans yeah. sent him so he said something amazing yeah. he said من Harun al-Rashid Amir al-Mu'minin إلى نقفور كلب روم The first line قد قرأت كتابك يا ابن الكافرة والجواب ما ما تراه دون أن تسمع. Translate for us. So he said uh, from Harun al-Rashid, uh, the leader of the believers, yeah. to Nakfur, the dog of Rome. Mm. I read your letter, you son of a kafir, kafir, <laughs> uh, this believer, and uh, the response is what you see without, what you hear without seeing it, or the opposite. <laughs> There was one particular one which I found really interesting. I don't want to go into too de- detail about this, but one what the one one guy said it to another guy and he, he dropped dead. Do you know? Do you know which one? Yeah, he dropped dead from it. <laughs> yeah, I need to I need to find it. It's, uh, one poet from Hijaz he said it to another poet, and then the guy heard it and he he had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> but the the verse I was telling you is in Tahmil alayhi al-mathmathaluhu kamathal al-kalb. This, but Allah, the balagh in this verse is amazing. Because, can you, can someone get me the verse? Because before it, there's another thing. Before it, uh, but before it, there's another verse, uh, which there's a lot of, of that going, istara going on there. Mm-hmm. It's very beautiful. I was thinking about, I was talking with someone about this verse the other, you know, this verse. <laughs> فلما عتوا عما نهوا عنه قلنا لهم كونوا قرزة خاسئين. لا لا it's not it's not the same verse is it مثل هو مثل الفرس كلب. can you not find the ayah that comes before it? right before it. yeah right one ayah before it. ذلك نفصل الآيات إلى. no right but one before one before. okay. أو تقول إنما أشرك أباؤنا من قبل وكنا ذر ذرية من بعدهم أفتهلكنا بما فعل المبطلون. keep going. Before that, yeah. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ Is that, is that it? Yeah, is it? It's no, no, no. Araf, right? It's Araf, yeah, but okay. uh, you're a method of Kamath al-Kalb. Go after it, it might be after that. After it, yeah. No, no, it's definitely before it, man. I'll come, I'll come to it, I'll come to it, I'll come to it. Okay. But basically, um, there's a time and a place. وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَا رَفَعْنَاهُ بِهَا وَلَكِنَّهُ أخلد إلى الأرض واتبع هوا. يا أخلد إلى الأرض واتبع هوا. yes yes yes. so أخلد إلى الأرض واتبع هوا. so no no there's one before it. there's one before it. what does أخلد mean? أخلد يعني he took comfort. he went underneath. yeah he took comfort in being. yeah so basically one per I was reading some thing of this. Uh, Sheikh, and it's uh, very interesting because he was saying that there's a, the animal, the weasel, what's it called in Arabic? The one that goes, no, what's it called? The one that goes underneath the ground. The, 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 the weasel, yeah. It's not the weasel, khuld. Yeah, khuld. What's the, what's the animal called? Khuld. Is it a mole? Yeah. Okay, so, so this, is, this is what I understand from the air, basically. The khuld is a mole, yeah? Let's just call it a weasel for the sake of argument. Oh, uh, okay, is, is, it sim- is it similar or is it different? The mole digs tunnels. Yeah, yeah okay. It, it, so, Allah big. is saying, basically, yani, he's using a word saying he went into the earth. But the root word of this word is a mole. You're, you get it? So, he's not saying you, he's not attacking directly by saying, He starts off warming up the insult. So, he warms it up by saying, Yeah? So his istara, mekne, I think it is, yeah, where he's, he's using a kind of uh, how would you say istara? Is he's using a kind of um, yeah, but what's istara? How do you how do you how do you translate istara? He's using yeah, he's indirectly linking it. That's beautiful. Yeah, he's indirectly linking it. So for example, for example, um, what's what's the word makhalid? What's what's that for the the famous saying about the the person, yeah, the mania. Yeah, so he showed his claws. If I say, for example, he showed his, someone showed his claws, I'm not using the thing directly, but I'm using an indirect reference. 
So Allah in the first part, he's in direct reference to the mole. He's animalizing this behavior. He's animalizing it. He's saying, look, you're acting like an animal, right? Like the mole that goes under the ground. Then he does a direct simile, because now it's a simile, right? With the kalb, with a dog. So مَثَلُهُ كَمَثَلُ الْكَلْبِ إِنْ تَحْمَلْ عَلَيْهِ يَلْهَثُ وَإِنْ تَتْرُكُهُ يَلْهَثُ So he's saying that similitude of him is like a dog. What I'm saying is that the Qur'an is using these uh, insults effectively for people. And Allah Sabila. And many of those insults. Then it shows you that there's rhetoric in that. Can you argue that uh, one time they were insulting Abu Bakr Allah, saying you're going to leave? Yes, tell, tell us about this one please brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure but, but they were insulting him saying the yes. Sahaba is going to leave the Prophet Hamza yes, yes. and he said uh, go lick the clitoris of your goddess. Yes, like that. he did say that. Yeah. He, say, he said is that. that how it was? Um, so right, he, like he did say that. He did say one that. of the idols, yeah. <coughs> he said a private I said, part. Yeah, he did say that. Clitoris, <laughs> No, I mean, I actually yeah. heard some modern day commentators, I'm not going to mention names, doing like a, a biography of Abu Bakr Siddiq and oh. saying that that was wrong, you shouldn't have done that. Mm. But if it was wrong, why didn't the Prophet Sassam correct him? In fact, sorry to be more explicit, but why did the Prophet Sassam himself say, go and bite the, yani, the penis of your father? But the guy that was, uh, he was doing istifkhar with his lineage, he was effectively being like a lineage... Uh, Racist, yeah. So, so he's trying to say to him, look, if you're really pleased with what you couldn't control from your father's sperm, go and sorry to say, bite it. Yeah, and it's sometimes, <laughs> no, and I'm presenting two sides of it. Yes. Yeah, but the hadith itself. Yeah, it's, the, the Prophet sallallahu mentioned, mm. if you see a person that mm. does that action, then tell him. Tell him. To tell him. To tell him uh, so it's even, it's yeah, even so, more strong. Yeah, yeah. But uh, 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 yeah, I just want to correct that. Uh, the story is not that it happened yeah, fine, as an fine. incident and the Prophet oh, oh, yes. That's why you're here, Sheikh. There's going to be a lot of corrections happening. It's huh? hypothetical. It's hypothetical. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's hypothetical. Yeah. I don't do hypothetical, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do you see the point? The point is if the Prophet says, it's this guy, see, imagine if I went to somebody and said, go suck your mom. Sorry, Sayyan. Go suck it. And yeah. actually, a companion <laughs> did what the Prophet <laughs> advised. Yeah. Yeah, and this happened, I think, Lu Ka'b bin Malik saw a person. Yeah. yeah, and relating to her, his lineage, so he commented, he and people were, yeah, yani, a bit shocked and surprised. Yeah, so like for, he mentioned the hadith. For example, if if, so, if some racist guy, uh, maybe I don't know, can you do khayas, Sheikh? Some racist guy says, "Look, I'm 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 the best because I'm from I don't know uh, a country. I'm not going to mention a country's name." I say, "Look, go and suck your dad." Sorry to say, is that too deep? You think or bite your dad's penis? So it has to be the same language. Yeah, yeah, this is a very politically incorrect thing to say. Um, very controversial for the people to hear this. But the, the point is, is that nowadays we've had this pacifist Islam for too long. It's never presented. Islam is never presented like this to us. It's, it's always presented like, you know, it's almost presented like Christianity. Christianity. It's like, the, give him the, the, the right. No, no. I, I, I'm going to tell you the Prophet ﷺ was patient. And I'm going to tell you, yes, he controlled his anger 100%. Because the examples I've told you before, but I'm also going to tell you, he said these things one, two, and three. I'm also going to tell you that uh, there were these incidents with the Sahabas which were endorsed by the Prophet. And that's the f that is a fair picture because if I don't tell you, then the enemy of Islam will tell you this. And he will misapply that. So I might as well save you the heartache and tell you, look, our theory says, or our belief is, yes, we'll be abused as a minority. But the answer to that abuse is not to take it on the cheek and, and, and give them the other cheek. The answer to abuse is to give them with proportionality what they've given you, with proportionality. The key word is proportionality. Islam is a religion of proportionality. That's what Allah says in the Quran. That if someone, the, 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 the compensation, this is exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. The compensation of someone doing something bad to you is something bad like it. It's true. Allah says, Whoever pardons and forgives, then, huh? then, then the, the, the reward will be with Allah. And However, Allah says, he continues, he says, whoever wants to go and get his right after he's been oppressed, then th that person has no blame on him. 
Ayn Ayn. Yeah, the Ayn Ayn is in the Quran as well, but I'm saying that if, if, if you see someone trying to, 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 to get their own back after they've been slapped, don't stop them. That's not the religion of Islam. Someone punches them, you're saying, no, don't, don't do it, brother. No, no, let him punch him back. And this kind of thing even extends to when you're arbitrating situation. Would you say it's a higher virtue, however, to have forbearance, forgiveness in Allah such situations? Allah says it himself. So he says, وَمَنْ عَفَ وَأَصْلَحْ فَأَجَرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ He says that, Allah, because we're trying to follow the... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's something else though. That's, that's more like um, eschatological now. That's more like hereafter. But this one is, وَلَمَنْ انتصر بَعْدَ ظُلْمِهِ Allah is saying, if you are forgiving, Allah will give you a reward. If a Muslim person slaps you in your face, and you, for example, forgive them, yes, you'll get reward for that. Mm. But if you fight them back and give them a slap back, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Mm. There's no sin on you. There's no sin. 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 This is what Allah says. That certainly only blame is given to those people who oppress the people and walk in the world with oppression. It's the religion of balance. It's the religion of elegance. It's the golden mean. Whenever it will be seen as weak, don't do it. Whenever it will be seen as aggressivity, don't do it. But, yani, we're in between two. There's nothing, there's nothing new here, but we're showing you how these virtues manifest themselves in reality. It's not aesthetically or it's not aesthetic or virtuous to accept punishment and have no response. It's not, it's not from good behavior. It's not good behavior. It's weak behavior. And we've been told too many times in the society we live in, look in the Meccan period, this and that. You're misrepresenting the Meccan period. Misrepresenting. Anyway, we move on. When it got too bad, the Prophet ﷺ told the people to go to Abyssinia. And the, there was two migrations to Abyssinia. The first one, according to Ibn Qayyim Zad Ma'ad, was in the fifth year of prophethood. A group of 12 people, including four women, went to Abyssinia, including Uthman ibn Affan and the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Ruqayya. And the second time, there was 83 men and 19 women. And we have a famous story. I don't know the authenticity of it. But where, I'm sure it's in the message, the film, the message, where, you know, Jafar was there and then Amr ibn al-As came and he tried to get them back. And he said, and then he had to defend himself and all these kind of things. I haven't, to be fair, Looked at how authentic that story. The debate itself. Yeah. No, so it's authentic. It's authentic. It may, it may be in Bukhari Muslim. Yeah. Oh, that's a good thing to share. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, yes. I don't know if is it in Bukhari Muslim, Sheikh. Yeah, I can check it now. Yes, please. Just yeah, okay. So, um, so that's why the Sheikh is here because um, <laughs> unfortunately I will not suff suffice. There's another issue I want to bring up, and it's good the Sheikh is here because it's a complex aqidah issue, which is the issue of Najashi. Najashi obviously was the Negus of the time. His name was the Negus. He was the, is the king, the title of the leader of Abyssinia at the time. And his name was Ashama, because Najashi is a title, it's not actually the name. Well, at least that's what people say that his name was. And the place of inhabitation was this place we spoke about already called Aksum, which is, which is in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. Now, Tigray, I don't know if you know about what's happening in Ethiopia. There's a civil war happening in Ethiopia, or at least it was happening, the, the fighting has really settled down a lot now, and it's a very unfortunate civil war with what I see as atrocities on both sides. I mean, it seemed like there's atrocities on both sides. But, and you have the president of the country, of Ethiopia, who's meant to have a Nobel Peace Prize, and his soldiers are doing all kinds of ridiculous things. He's a Muslim guy, or at least Muslim by name. Uh, so Tigray is a region in Eritrea and Ethiopia, and it spans about 5 million to 6 million people who speak that language and are from that tribe. Um, and so when they went to that place, it's, um, it's modern-day Ethiopia. A very beautiful place. I mean, they would have seen things they would never have seen in Saudi Arabia. And obviously, and this goes without saying, for them to migrate, they would have had to take a ship. Because, I, I know this is an easy fact, but there's no way to get to Ethiopia from Saudi Arabia or from Arabia at the time without taking a ship. It's African... Asia, you yeah? know, so they had to cross the Red Sea, that's what they had to do, so you could imagine, and this is not, I don't think any narration is mentioned about the journey, like what, what that kind of journey, that would have been or a rough journey, it would have been a rough journey, that would have been a very rough journey, um, to get from 
you know, Mecca all the way down to, I don't know where they would have had to gone, like Port City or Jeddah or something, get on a ship with 83 people and then it would be in turbulent and volatile times on the, on the Red Sea. How long would it have taken in the sea to cross that sea? I don't think it would have been that bad. No, nah, it wouldn't have been that bad. I think a couple of days at max, really. Maybe 24 hours even. I don't know. I, I, I'm speaking. <laughs> I've been on the Red Sea myself. I've, I've, I've traveled it. It's not that bad. And the, there's not that many waves on there, but there are sharks in there. I mean, there are, there are sharks in there. I, was, I wonder if there's any incidents. Because, uh, you know, when you go to Egypt, and so there's a Red Sea and all that. Someone's calling me. I'll just have to, have to shut up. So they went on the ship. They went into, and they would have seen greenery. They would have seen a different environment. People, the black people, they would have seen it with black people mixed with them. It would have expanded their horizons a little bit. Because now you're not seeing the majority of people population are not Arabs. They're blacks. I don't know about the situation in terms of like, how many slaves are surely that I mean we know other um, other empires took black slaves but whether the blacks took other black slaves I don't know because in this period I looked at, I tried to look it up and there's not even that much information about this this particular person but what is a contentious issue and I'm happy the sheikh is here is that this figure is used for a very popular debate among Islamists which is the issue of al-hukm bi ghayri ma anzal Allah ruling with what Allah hasn't revealed. Because he's usually used in the context that he became, Najashi later on became Muslim, right? And he didn't implement Islam in Ethiopia, or not Ethiopia, Abyssinia. So some of the groups would say, look, well, that means to say, if there is some other or some, it's not always the case that, some groups, of, which means, there's an ayah in the Qur'an that says, whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed is a disbeliever. Some groups allow the excuse of ability and some groups don't allow it. Notably, the takfirists don't allow it at all. Like, for example, ISIS. ISIS and Daesh and, uh, sorry, not the same thing really, isn't it? ISIS and Al-Qaeda and these groups, a lot of them don't accept the excuse at all. I've spoken to some of them, they don't accept it. So they'll say this, this country is a disbelieving country because its people, th this is, by the way, one of the main differences. I mean, I don't have time to speak to Piers Morgan about it. But I tried to squeeze it in in 10 minutes. So I, I can do it. But what, one of the main differences between ISIS and all these kind of things and other groups, because the Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas or any of these groups, they don't believe in this stuff, which is the following. A takfir at tasalsuli It's basically chain takfir. And this is how they build the argument. They say, look... The Quran states, that whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed, they're disbelievers. It doesn't matter whether or not their intention is to rule by what Allah has believed. You could say there's three opinions, bro. I'm not going to lie to you. One opinion is that you have to do istihlal bil qalb, which means that you have to believe in it with your heart. This opinion was favored by Albani. Uh, and a lot of his, his students like Ali Halib and others make a big deal about that opinion the other opinion is that it doesn't matter what your intentions are that it's all to do with what you actually do because it's mustahil aqlan it's impossible for you to believe that is what Allah has revealed and then rule by other than it and the third opinion is a lot of these countries they might ha the, the hukam or the the leaders might have an excuse, for example, Adam Lissata, that they can't actually implement these rules without some serious consequences from America, for example. No, that's different. That's ta'til. We're not talking about ta'til here. We're talking about you are putting laws in place which are secular laws, for example. Mm. We're not talking about suspension of laws and within the Sharia framework. We're talking about al hukm bi ma anzal Allah. So, uh, what I'm saying is that, so, yeah, for example, if Abdul Wahab was here today, yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry to, if Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was, what would, uh, his followers, what would he do with, what would his opinion be on the Islamic governments? I think he would consider them to be non-Muslim governments. I think he'd make takfir of all of them. But if Al-Bani was here, surely he wouldn't, he, he didn't do that. Because he believes, for example, you have to have istihlal bil qalb. A lot of the scholars are in between those two opinions and they'll say, look, it's true that you 
it doesn't make sense if you don't have the uh, other an excuse for you not to make ruling without Allah I believe but a lot of these hukam actually have adhar for example that they, they they can't implement this what are the adhar what are the, another question is what are the what are the excuses so that some of them will say for example al jahl for that's obviously no excuse ignorance but al-adam al-sata'a the inability to enact for example what's that country called the the one next to Malaysia and Indonesia Brunei <laughs> Brunei, yeah, when the guy tried to implement some laws, he was muhaddad, he, he was uh, threatened. So, are you going to say that he's a kafir because he's not implementing? He tried. Or homosexuality laws. Or yeah, whatever it was, like, you know, punitive laws. Um, then there's another thing, which, which I don't know what the sheikh, uh, maybe I, I haven't looked into this mess, but how? I have heard some people say that one excuse could be desires. I don't know if this is an excuse or not, but... For a fact, like some people have framed the argument in a particular way where they say that, for example, if you are a leader of a household as a man and you and your wife start drinking alcohol or you allow alcohol to be drank in your house for a day or you smoke some weed and you, your wife smokes it with you, for example, you have a weak moment. Does that mean you're a disbeliever? They'll say no because it's hawa. There's some, there's, you don't actually believe, which lends itself more to the second opinion. So you can see what, why these things are... But well, they use Najashi because Najashi, when he became Muslim, he didn't implement the laws of Islam. But some of them said there's two Najashis. Like Rishi Sunak became Muslim, how he would, he would implement it? If Rishi Sunak became Muslim, he couldn't implement it. Couldn't implement because Islam. He would be dismissed or let's say he would lose the job. Yeah, he couldn't. Or, all the there's no chance. He, he could, like within like Turkey as well. Yeah, yeah. Turkey is another. All of these are examples of where you cannot. Yeah, and it, you can, so people have to be a bit a bit careful with this people have to be careful with this and that's why like i've been seeing a lot of discussion online about the uh, attacking criticizing the rulers and this and that whatever I'm, now, Scotland. I'm not yeah no, no, i've made the, i made my own but <laughs> i've had my own no because he said something yeah i mean that's different i'm not talking about saying i'm saying about implementing it's different it's a different story so but, the main approach is you have to differentiate between two situations the first is not ruling on behalf of islam in a particular incident mm, mm. Mm. So, in general, he, he rules by the law of Islam, but on that particular incident, he didn't rule. Um, on basis, for example, he uh, had a bribe, for example, or anything, that would be committed as a sin, but we would, would not consider it as a kufr. Mm. But setting the rule, rules or laws and, yeah. and ruling on behalf of those laws, mm. that's the that's issue yeah, that's the is issue. Uh, uh, yani discussing. So Muslim Prime Minister... Very difficult. Basically. No, no. I, yeah, it's, so that's the discussion. So yes. The, the, let's say the issue of Hawa <coughs> is understandable in this, uh, the first context. Yeah. But the second context, mm -hmm. it's problematic to implement it because it's considered kufr within itself. It's yeah. like a person worshipping any being other than Allah Azza wa mm. on basis of, let's say, Hawa. Yeah. So it, uh, uh, Hawa doesn't affect the reality yes. of the matter. Yeah. So whether or not it's considered a kufr or a sinful action, yeah, one of the things that must be put under consideration that a Muslim is not accountable on any type of ruling of Islam unless he has the power, the potential, the capability to mm -hmm. implement it. Yeah. Yeah. So Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah used the argument of Najashi to show that if a ruler, let's say, doesn't have the capability, doesn't have, uh, yani, he will be overthrown, not on basis, let's say, of Hawa, because he just wants his throne, because of, let's say, the benefit of Islam itself. Because mm. what happened in Najashi, there was a Muslim community within uh, Al-Habasha. And if he was overthrown, mm. that community would be inflected. And this is shown in the narrations. So when uh, th there actually was uh, 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 an attempt to overthrow Najashi at the time, and the companions of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, and Najashi sent them uh, on the other end of a certain river. So, it, it, and he mentioned, in case I come out victorious, come back. If not, you can flee the country. So there was, the stakes were high, let's say. So he was grabbing on power on behalf of the Muslims in order to secure that Muslim community. So Ibn Taymiyyah actually mentioned uh, a couple of narrations that uh, the, uh, the thing went to the end that he was not even capable of announcing 
himself as a Muslim mm. and he would pray in a certain situation uh, not showing that he's praying, mm -hmm. let alone uh, implementing the rules of Islam. So the Najashi case goes back to... So would you say, Sheikh, that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion was to do with Qudra and Sata'a? Yeah, so uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, as, a, uh, as a rule of thumb, he mentions any ruling of Islam. A Muslim is not accountable unless he has Qudra. Capability. If he doesn't have a capability, then Allah Azzawajal doesn't make a Muslim accountable in the first place. So that applies in this situation as it, as it applies in any type of ruling of Islam. Beautiful. So Beautiful. that's uh, that uh, a thing that has to be put under consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and th these are the kind of nuances that these groups, yeah, yeah. a lot of them like Al Qaeda and Daesh and all these, they don't actually pay attention to them at all. And so that's where it becomes unfair to um, because what they do is actually worse than that. Okay. Al Qaeda and Daesh and all these uh, groups, what they'll do is they'll label the the leader as this believer, and then anyone who's connected to him. Or works in the government, even if you're a school teacher or a policeman, so long as you work for the government, you're a disbeliever as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because you're part of his system. So mm. they'll say, look, this is all tasalsul. These are all, cha this is what they call chain takfir. And so they'll bring it all the way back down to a layman. So, well, if you voted for him, then you also are implicated by that. So this is how, and then what that does is that they then use that as a legitimate, a, a way to legitimize killing civilians. They'll kill the, this man, this whatever, because actually you voted for this leader who's not ruling by what Allah has revealed. Now, with the Muslim Brother and Hamas don't have that approach. They have a different approach. If they do kill civilians, which we have yet to see, they have they don't have that, uh, for example, policy. They have not said we our policy is to kill civilians. By the way, yani, the, Hamas has never come out and said our policy is to kill civilians. In fact, they always deny that that's their policy. To be fair. But it's out of pragmatism or some other reason. It's because it just happened, crossfire or this or that. Or maybe some of their group members done that. But what we're saying is, is there, there's a, a hell of a lot of difference, a gulf of disparity between this group here and this group here. There's a, there's a gulf of disparity. And if someone tries to say academically they're the same thing, then frankly they, they don't understand how the whole thing works. But hopefully by now they know how it works. And that's why you'll find that a lot of the places where these Daesh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are, their main enemies are actually Muslims. Yeah. Like you, you won't find that their main enemies are, uh, for example, uh, Zionists or the Israelis. Even though they're close by, I mean, it wasn't well. They weren't far away. Uh, ISIS are not far away from. Funded, the, so sort of, uh, yeah, theories, they were killing other Muslims. They were killing the Kurds. Funded. They were killing uh, uh, Sunni Muslims. The Shiites. Funded by Zionists. Uh, really? Yeah, really? Uh, well, I mean, it does make it uh, does make sense. Divide and conquer. Yeah. And conquer. Yeah. But yeah, as as we were saying there, it's. Um, Ideologically, there's a, there's a gulf of disparity. Anyway, so uh, that is Najashi, yes. If ISIS was in uh, Gaza, they would be attacking the Muslims by yes. that standard. They if don't. ISIS was in, that's a great point. That is a fantastic point. That, really? If if ISIS was in Gaza, their main their main enemy will not be Israel. Their main enemy will be Hamas. Undoubtedly, was. because I mean they, they were coming out and saying, look, uh, if we could if we get a chance, we're, we're going for the Egyptians. Yeah. I remember yeah, the mythic fear of Morsi and through going from, and these guys have a very similar like Hamas are closer to the Muslim Brotherhood yeah. than they are to these groups. They're just an armed Muslim Brotherhood. That's what they are. Like they're quite pragmatic. Well, if you think about their politics, it's pretty pragmatic mm. compared to um, obviously the other ones. They they don't believe in negotiation. In fact, ISIS never believes in negotiation. If ISIS had hostages, you know what they would do? They'd kill every single one of them, yeah. including the boy, the baby. They, they did. No, they they would not. They would never ever. They would kill every single... That's what they would do. They, would, they wouldn't even bargain or, or do anything like that. So that, there's a gulf of disparity. And I think if the propaganda that we're hearing nowadays is the same thing. It's, not, it's definitely not the same thing. I had a question uh, about... Is it true Bilal is originally from Abyssinia yeah. and he refused to go? Or I mean, sorry, he did not refuse, but he chose to stay in Mecca and not go. Is that correct? I don't know, Sheikh. What do you think about that? He's the well-known label of Bilal. Yeah. Bilal Habash. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, Shows. Okay, the next thing we're going to do now, we're going to take a quick break, and in this time, I've uh, uh, slides nine until the end. Okay, is about the boycott that the Prophet and the, and the companions uh, were subjected to in Mecca, the muqata, the boycott. What I want you guys to do, because uh, I realize I speak a lot too much, uh, too much in these sessions, is 
um, I want to spend five, ten minutes reading it and then doing bullet points in chronological order of the main points. After that, we'll feed back all the main points from, from 9 to 16. Yeah, so that's what, how many is that? Seven pages, yeah? So we read seven pages. We then summarize them in bullet points and then we come back and feed feedback. And what I might do is... Uh, Okay, do 10 bullet, 10 bullet points. How many of us are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, it's, there's, there's 10 of us, and the Sheikh uh, will obviously supervise us. Um, so we'll do 10 bullet points, and then each of you will have one bullet point that you read out. But do all 10 by yourself. Does that make sense? So I'll give you 10 minutes to do that, and then after that, we'll come back and conclude, inshallah. All right, assalamu alaikum, welcome back. Uh, let's start from the left side and then go all the way uh, to the right. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna quickly summarize what happened with the boycotts. And the Sheikh is going to supervise this. So you better be on your best behavior. <laughs> Only joking. Let's start with uh, Uthman. What is the first uh, point? So we had the first point as the boycott of Bani Hashim and Bani Al Muttalib. So a confederation of pagans in Mecca led by Baqid bin Amir bin Hashim agreed to boycott these tribes, refusing business, uh, marriage, uh, even verbal contact with them, um, and obviously especially targeting the, the Prophet, peace be upon him. Okay, fantastic. Let's go for the second one. Yes, the siege in, in Shib of Abu Talib. Uh, Abu Talib led Banu Hashim and Banu al-Mutalib to a valley near Mecca where they faced a three-year siege. Enduring extreme hardship and starvation. And this is, subhanAllah, one of the things we spoke about in the previous session uh, when we were comparing between what's happening in Gaza and now. And just to remind everyone, it's, it's amazing how Allah he prepares the cream of the crop through this, the same methods. It's the same methods. Starvation, hunger, uh, extreme conditions, and so on and so forth. This is something that the Prophet and the companions went through as well. Let's go for the third one. Sure. Uh, desperate conditions. The besieged suffered greatly, eating tree leaves and animal skin, skins, with children particularly affected by hunger. Yes, unbelievable. And this is a slow and painful um, kind of torture, to be honest. Sometimes it's more, it's easier to just die quickly than to die in these slow conditions. Ali? Are we reading from this text here? Yeah, the, yeah, you could do, yeah. Fourth discussion and in, uh, internal strife. Uh, where, where is that? Smuggling of food. The last one. Oh, the last one. <coughs> Number four. Oh, smuggling of food. Hakim, Hakim bin Hizam and others occasionally smuggled food to the besieged, <coughs> facing opposition from figures like Abu Jahan. Okay. Yeah, next. Uh, d despite the tough conditions, uh, Rasulullah persisting on his prayer in Mecca in the public display which shows uh, you subhanAllah like this wallahi in it itself is such a power powerful proof of prophethood that is true yeah so that's on the fifth point that he didn't stop or hide it his um, ibadat from Amazing. the public especially in Kaaba mm -hmm. he was still go there and pray he didn't give up didn't, didn't give up didn't I, I, want, I want to mention another point we spoke about uh, 48 laws of power, Machiavellianism, and so on. I want to make another point about the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, I had a conversation one time with a particular individual, and we were talking about what real influence is. So he started making uh, points about capitalist ownership of property, ownership of business and entrepreneurship and stuff. And, he gave the example of Colonel Saunders, you know, the KFC guy. He said, look at how many people are basically like in how, how many people are franchised to this one organization that, that was started by this one guy. And he said, don't you see the power that someone like, let's say even say Elon Musk. It's a better example. Yeah? Someone like Elon Musk has PayPal, you know, Starlink, uh, what's the other thing? Uh, Tesla, X, 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 all these things. Many people, if you ask people in the streets who do you consider me to be the most powerful man in the world some would probably say the US president and I, I guarantee you some of them will say Elon Musk yes. just because of how much money he has mm. 
And so leadership from that perspective is, let's call it the capitalist model, the free market model. But I've got, I had one question to ask that person, and I've got one question to ask the public. Is that, can Elon Musk motivate people to, to put their own lives on the line for him, for him? For example, if you get all of the employees of Elon Musk, and he put Tesla, he put X, he put all of these, all the employees, big assembly, like an assembly style, all the people are standing up. And you say to them, and he says to them, listen, we're going to war tomorrow. We're going to war against you this share, and against this company shares in Tesla against this company is BMW have, have to cross the line you know they they've now been copying our you know this. would anyone go to war for him no. the answer is no and the reason why I bring this to your attention is because what I'm saying is the Machiavellian model of power leverage is playing checkers that's playing checkers the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's where chess is being played because the ultimate leverage, and this is something if I was meant to have a discussion with Robert Greene himself, I've had the discussion, I tell him this, I tell him the ultimate leverage is not through money and guns, although it is a leverage and no one will deny it, it's through love and belief in a higher cause. So the Prophet ﷺ, when his followers, who are small in number, in Mecca, being tortured, being harmed, being starved, they continued being his followers. That wasn't due to the fact that he was leveraging them with money. It's because they believed in him and because they loved in him. Loved him. Yes. Just for the sake of argument, how would that differ to fear? Fear from the hellfire. So that's a great question. And there was a movie I watched some time ago, which was some a couple of days ago. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually called A Bronx Tale. Mm. And it was actually about... The, whoever wrote this movie was incredibly intelligent person. It's a true story. Yeah, it's a true story. Yeah. Uh, Robert De Niro, right? Uh, Robert De Niro, yeah. Ch Charles Palmentieri. And that movie, mm. if, if you remember, Robert De Niro was the hard-working uh, bus, bus driver. Yeah. And, and, um, and then you had another figure who's the mafia leader. Okay. Who's a mafia leader. Mm -hmm. And this young boy, he was, he was torn between his father and the mafia leader who took him when he was younger. He was torn between the two figures. And the mafia leader was ac effectively saying statements from Machiavelli's the prince and he oh, you mentioned fear and that's why I'm answering your question at one point he stated and I think this is in the, in the prince it's better to be feared than loved he said that that's a flawed model that is a flawed model and that's wrong psychologically it's wrong a mother would sacrifice herself due to love not due to fear and we've spoken about this when we talk about ethical egoism and stuff like that love is the, the epitome the apex of emotion that human beings can experience and the biggest fear of all is the fear of losing love that that fear there is actually more than the fear of uh, you know worldly a gun or a or a prison sentence and so the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before, before i before the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the reason why he was the greatest leader of all time was not due to his strategic military abilities although even disbelievers would say he was they would say he was one of the top of all time. We would say he's the best of all time. And we can prove. He just wasn't given the opportunities. Wait, uh, one second. Sorry to cut you off. I just, just want to make the point. The point I'm making to you is the following. Is that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was able to catch. He was able to leverage his followers through love. They believed in a higher cause. And there's nothing higher. Nothing better. Nothing more noble. Nothing more honorable than believing and worshipping in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what he was offering them. He was offering them the hereafter. He was offering them heaven and hell. And you'll see this theme as we talk about Aqaba 1 and Aqaba 2 and all these things that will come up. You'll see this theme play out. He didn't have money to give. And he didn't ask for money from anyone. That's what made him the most incredible leader. Now let me just add a, a layer to that. You'll say, well, and some will say this, religion is the opiate of the masses. What differentiates what you're saying playing devil's advocate, with the rise of Hitler, for example, or one of these, Stalin or Lenin or whoever maybe. What happened when Hitler failed? He killed himself, but not just that, everyone killed themselves, I think with the exception of one of them, maybe Goebbels or who was it? Uh, uh, he killed himself in the trial. Uh, he killed himself, yeah, 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 in the trial, after the trial he killed himself, right? Goering. 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 Yeah, Goering killed, um, didn't kill himself, right? 
He did. He killed oh, himself. Oh, yeah, they all killed themselves. He was sentenced was to death. Yes. Uh, and he had a uh, cyanide pill cyanide, in, in the uh, moisturizing cream. Yes. So he hid it. Some, yeah. some of his people gave it to him or something. He, he took it. He, he, he was one in the, the trial, time. right? He had it all the time. He had it all the whole time. In, in a moisturizing cream, he was very vain. Who was the one who killed his kids? Yeah, and the then killed himself? Guy. Goebbels. Yeah, Goebbels killed his kids and then killed himself. So uh, the reason why I bring this to your attention is the following. Hitler, undoubtedly, if you compare Elon Musk, objectively, Elon Musk, for example, and Hitler, Hitler's more influential. There's no doubt because the, the people would die for him, but they wouldn't die for Elon Musk. Everyone agrees, right? But here's the difference. Because Nazism or Marxism or any other ism any other ism that people have died and lived and died for wasn't connected to afterlife. <clears throat> no, but the afterlife in particular. That there's this, if you die, if you die, then there's going to be a continuation. There's a, it's not cessation of your, yourself. Because they, they, what they were bringing to the table wasn't that. Unfortunately for them, Unfortunately for the rest of unfortunately, just and say, because someone said, did he say, did he say unfortunately? Unfortunately for the rest of the world, yes, they as when their project died, when their mission failed, they killed themselves. It was the expiration of themselves. That would never happen with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When this shows you that the religion of Islam, where it has an eschatological component, the idea of worshiping and believing in one God. There's no ideology of a secular nature that can match that. So we've shown you why it's, this is checkers and this is chess. Because checkers is you're moving around money, moving around guns, dictatorships, authoritarian regimes. Checkers level two is, okay, fine. We'll give them a cause or we'll give them something to rally behind. Marxism or we'll give them a Nazism or we'll give them even liberalism, whatever it may be. But because it doesn't have an extension to the year after, they won't take it to, the, they won't take it to that level. Islam, because it has a connection to the hereafter, the cause is connected to your death. There's no other thing which can connect your cause. There's nothing anyone else can give you which is higher than that. Therefore, religion, if you say it's an opioid of the masses, it's the most effective opioid of the masses. And, and, and that's what Marx would have had, wish, wish, wishes that he could have had. He says it's the opium of the masses. Well, he wishes that it was Marxism could eat for, could compete, could, can't compete, because it, it stops at the point of death. Doesn't tell you where you're going to be in the hereafter. So, there's nothing objectively that has been or can be more of an incentivizing factor for an individual to rally behind than a religion which promises a hereafter. And we'll talk about any religion. Sorry to say, we're not talking about reincarnation. Where you can become a grasshopper afterwards, because that's not an, that's not a suitable incentive. It's not. We're not talking about this or that. We're not talking about uh, even in Jewish eschatology. Do you th they don't have developed heaven and hell. In Jewish eschatology, they don't have a developed heaven and hell. It's only Islam and Christianity that has developed ideas of eschatology. But with Christianity, as we've mentioned and we know, the idea of God is is uh, incoherent. So it's only Islam that can combine those things and it's only the Prophet who gave Islam and that's why the people were so motivated. Nothing can, nothing can be a substitute for that. That's why the Prophet ﷺ was the greatest leader of all time. He was the greatest leader of all time because he had the best cause which, was, which made sense of death and because he, was, he had the impeccable virtue which was manifested which made people love him and willing to not only live but die for him. This is not Elon Musk and or Hitler or this one or that one. It's a different, completely different level. Sorry, you were going to say. I was going to say, to show the power of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that if the British Empire tried to ban alcohol and they failed miserably with all their power. That's so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1,400 years ago commanded it and what a billion, billions of people currently yeah. are holding to his command. Are you talking about the abolition in America? And Britain, America, maybe. Sorry. Yeah, the yeah. abolition. They tried, they failed miserably. They failed miserably but yeah. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1,400 years ago commanded mm. and you have billions of people mm. On that Absolutely, that's a good, that's a great example. Fantastic. Let's go to the sixth uh, point. Uh. Breaking mm -hmm. the pact, mm. uh, dissension among Meccans led to a group, including Hisham ibn Amr and uh, Zuhair ibn Abi Umayya, advocating for the end of the boycott. Mm. Fantastic. 
Next. As people are doing now for Gaza. Yes, yes. Divine intervention. The Prophet Sallallahu received the revelation that ants had eaten the, or, yeah, ants had eaten the written pact, sp sparing only the parts with God's name, leading to the agreements, the, the solution. Mm -hmm. And then uh, came the health decline of uh, Abu Talib and uh, the Quraysh. Uh, have, you, have you missed number eight? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the end of the siege after three years, the pact was uh, nullified, uh, allowing Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and others to return from the exile. Fantastic. Number, uh, we'll go back. Are you first? Yeah. Yeah. Health decline of Abu Talib. Post boycott, Abu Talib's health deteriorated, promoting Mecca leaders to negotiate directly with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fantastic. Musa, number 10. Sorry, uh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, proposition to Quraysh. Hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam offered the Quraysh leaders uh, a path to greater power if they accepted monotheism, which they ultimately rejected, holding to their ancestral ancestral religion. And these are some of the ayahs came down which everyone's familiar with. Quli ayyuhul kafirun la'abudu ma ta'abudun and these kinds of non-compromising ayahs. And do you know, the time where you would want to compromise is when you're going to die. This, wallahi, shows you not only the resilience but the resolve. This is one of the most powerful arguments for the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like this boycott went on for many years. And the conditions were not favorable. So why would he endure that? Why would the people endure that? Unless they truly believed that this was something that was from God. With that, we conclude. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.